Hello. Uh, my name is Sean Slew, and I am uh, going to be talking today about blockchain and crypto security, what every ICO or an investor uh, needs to know. And uh, after, uh, I'll be doing uh, question and answer, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me, and I'll be available after my presentation over in the corner I'm handing back my tech stuff uh, to uh, if you want to ask further questions or details. Okay, so a uh, quick outline on what my presentation today is going to consist of. So the first thing is um, I'm going to give you a little bit about my background, 20 years, uh, 10 of those in Silicon Valley, 10 years in Europe in the venture capital and security, cybersecurity world. And then um, I'm going to give you a quick overview on um, a historical perspective on how I see the crypto and blockchain world. And, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the different security levels that are available in, in the crypto and blockchain world and stuff that's been available for a long time and some of the newer developments that I, I've been seeing. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the security and vendors out there that I see that I've had contact with. It won't be an exhaustive list, but just some direction on where I see the, the technology, uh, where it is today, and where it could be going in the future. Also then we'll take a look at what some of the, uh, what to look for if you're an investor or you're running, um, you're part of a tech company in blockchain and crypto, what are the kind of things you should look for from a, purely from a security perspective the questions you should be asking the companies, the CTOs, the CEOs, the board, uh, and if you are uh, one of running a crypto company, some of the key things that you might not know on the cutting edge of security, some of the best practices that are out there in the whole security world. Uh, specifically around mobile, uh, a little bit about it web, but uh, things that are specific to crypto and blockchain. And then um, I, 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 we're going to look at uh, six or seven real world hacks, uh, what went wrong and what could the companies have done better. You know, a little bit of learning and uh, there's a lot of them. I think the headline there is that uh, real world hacks, I think about it's approaching $800 million have been stolen from just exchanges over the last, uh, in 2018. So it's, it's gone up significantly. And we'll look at some of those hacks and, and, and what could have been improved. Um, uh, one thing to take away there is that uh, that headline, it's really only, eight, around 800 million is really only what's reported. And there's a lot of people that have lost crypto that might be too embarrassed. So my guess is it's probably around a billion dollars have been lost uh, just in 2008, up significantly from 2017. So we'll look at some real hacks, uh, some real world hacks and some scams. Uh, and then uh, conclusion, I'll talk a little bit about what I think is going to be happening in the security in the, in the crypto space. And uh, I think what we'll be seeing in the future is companies will take a, a holistic, a very holistic approach and look at uh, things besides just the blockchain. So a lot of people think, oh, it's blockchain, it has to be secure, but you have to look at the whole layers. So I think that's kind of a, a roughly uh, what I'll be talking about as well as putting in some interesting things that I've, I've been seeing in the crypto world. So a little bit about myself, uh, my background, my sordid past. I am, uh, have been doing mobile security for uh, approaching 20 years now, and I am an investor. Uh, I do a lot with an M&A, and I sit on the board of three or four companies in a few verticals, but all, all around mobile security uh, and cyber security. So I've been doing that for the cyber part of things, probably about 20 years. Uh, and before that, I was uh, uh, done things in things like clean tech, but uh, always around technology is, is my life. And I spent 10 years in Silicon Valley and the last 10 years in, in London. And uh, between that, I spent a couple of years in Asia as well. So uh, I think the biggest job that I really had over the last 20 years is working at Gem Alto. I was the employee number one for their internal venture capital fund. And Gem Alto back then was the number one cybersecurity, mobile and cybersecurity company in the world doing smart cards. 
I had uh, three smart cards on me, all Jim Alto ones, when I was doing my MBA at London Business School, and I'd never heard of the company. And so I had to do a project, and I thought, this is something interesting. I'm using their product in three places on me, and I've never heard of the company. That's, that's something interesting, and I thought that was the future. So uh, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of the layers that we all see in the crypto world, in the blockchain world, are not new. So the software component of blockchain is an evolution of software that's been around since the, you know, it was invented in the 70s and in 80s. So it's a it's an evolution, but three quarters or maybe 80% of what's in the blockchain world has been out there and has been stress tested and being used by very large companies for, you know, over a decade. So I did some of the first uh, crypto we didn't call it crypto, we called it um, digital wallets uh, and security. Some of the electronic money projects, uh, I did the, one of the first big deployments of Mondex in 1999. And uh, there's a picture of me standing, uh, this is, was taken in Seoul, Korea. I'm the tall, skinny guy in the background. But, uh, so that was uh, one of the first electronic wallets with crypto in the form of loyalty points on a credit card with MasterCard. And that was deployed by some very, very large Korean and four or five Japanese banks. So that was about 20,000 uh, cards. Now they would be crypto cards, but back then we just called them e-wallets. Uh, a little interesting story about that is uh, I would have never, that project would have never launched if I had to do it today. Gem Plus was very, very late in getting the, the cards. They needed to be personalized to Korea. So I was required to get on a plane with a suitcase. This was way before you know, uh, TSA existed. So I got stopped and they said, well, what's in the suitcase? And I opened it up and it was 20,000 blank credit cards um, in a huge box. And the guy said, well, wh where is this? They loaded. I'm like, no, 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 there's no money on them. And I went in my wallet and I pulled out my MasterCard uh, that said I was an employee of MasterCard on this project based in Korea. I think that's the only way I didn't go to jail that, that day that they thought I was some smuggler. Um, so the, the, a lot of the technology, the infrastructure for a public key infra, uh, for the blockchain and crypto has been around since the, the 1990s. Uh, but it's a, definitely a huge advancement. So we did e-money, uh, we did loyalty, and uh, you know, millions of cards, EMV, using most of the blockchain and crypto infrastructure has been in place since, since the 90s. So uh, today, the two relevant companies that I'm working with uh, in this space, uh, the first one is m First Security. They do shielding around apps. Uh, they're probably, they're, their core technology is probably used by 100 financial and bank institutions around the world. And then bank groups, which is developing some of the hardware, excuse me, some of the software and an open platform for financial services in the, in the blockchain world. Okay. So uh, a little bit uh, about the, the, the major, three major layers of the blockchain. Uh, if you look at the blockchain and crypto layers and, and roughly some of the vulnerabilities. So you see the green layer, which is the HSM, the hardware security module layers. So this is what is, is, generates a lot of the, the public key, uh, the, the keys that blockchain and crypto wallets use. HSM has been around for a long time. If, uh, if anybody here has used HW, uh, AMS, uh, Amazon services, you're using Gemalto, uh, public key infrastructure to log on. So it's something that's been around for, it's never been hacked, and most of the world's banks use stuff by Gemalto, IBM, uh, and there's a few other French companies, but those are the big ones. So that layer, the layer above that is the, is the you know, we call it the middle, the middle layer. Uh, AWS uses the, the hardware to, to get keys, and it's hardware and firmware. And then a lot of people know from the crypto and blockchain world, I would say the various modules are the top layer. And, that, and that's what a lot of investors get excited about, a lot of people see, and that's what people consider that's the blockchain and crypto world. But the other layers have been there for a long time, and new players like Corda, uh, R3, 
EOS, these middle layers are relatively new in, in coming on board, but they're only one layer. The whole stacks have been there, and some companies are trying to do the whole stack, and some are just looking at the top layer. So as an investor, and from a security perspective, one thing I would always ask companies that I invest in or want to get involved in is, okay, how much of that stack are you going to do? And are you well resourced enough to be able to do enough pieces of that stack to really be secure? Okay, so a lot of companies, as we know, do uh, only a small piece of it. Some are trying to do a larger piece of it and some are trying to do all of it. So that's one thing as an investor to look at. Do they have the resources to really do that and reinvent the wheel? Is there a business reason and a technical reason to actually do those extra pieces of the stack? So you've got the physical, you've got the middle, and then you have the top layer. Um, and there's a few different ideas around some of the security issues that can develop uh, and are a concern if you're, depending upon what layer you're working with. So I think from the top, uh, one of the big things is when you're dealing with decentralized network is how do you trust? Um, one thing we see is that when the transaction, when you push the go button, and in the time it takes for that transaction to be certified, whether it's one player or multiple nodes, is there any chance that that transaction can be manipulated? And some of the bigger, uh, some of the hacks that have happened in the crypto have, have been because, you know, uh, Bitcoin and some of the s slower ones, some of the early cryptos, there's some delay there. So people are used to a delay and in that time things can happen. So those are the, the three main layers and um, I'm sure there's people in this room that are kind of experts in, in, in each piece. But that's a, a general overview. I'll say, so now we're going to kind of look at uh, uh, what to look for in the, uh, the blockchain, the ICOs, from a little bit more detailed perspective. So the major components <coughs> of a company in this space would be you know, the governance, the network, the distribution um, of the organization, also the programming, how the accounts are actually working and set up, and then the, the transactions part of that chain. So those are all the key things as an investor and as a security expert you would want to look at and examine and do due diligence on, on for a company perspective. So uh, I've broken it down into a few different segments and I'm gonna start with the uh, hot, warm, and cold wallets. So if you look at the, I think in 2008, last count kind of August, $731 million had been stolen from exchanges, which is probably the biggest segment. And you might ask yourself, well, why? Exchanges are unique because they're moving a lot of money in real time and a lot of that money is stored in a hot wallet because transactions are happening. Some of the big ones are doing you know, billions of dollars a day. And when you're doing that kind of volume in a hot wallet, you can siphon stuff off and it's easy. It's, it's hard to track those kind of transactions and find fraud. Where if you're dealing with a bank, their stuff is going to be in a cold storage and probably in an underground vault somewhere and it's gonna be harder to access. But exchanges, because there's transactions, it's hot. And then you get warm wallets, which have a component of both. So anything that you're looking to invest in, this, you'd wanna see how much is hot, how much is warm, and how much is cold. And best practices say that, you know, if you're a financial institution or you're in the crypto world, and somebody can walk into your office and take all your computers and walk off, best practices say they should get away with no more than 2% of your digital assets. So a lot of the companies I work with, I make sure that they have a program such that if they lose everything, they're only losing 2%. So 98% should be in cold storage somewhere. Um, one, another aspect is the mobile shielding. A, a lot of apps, uh, you can download them very easily, test them, and you'll see that there's a lot of communications and security flaws, especially with things like GDPR, uh, in compliance regulations in Europe coming through, there's really much tighter security around web and mobile apps. A lot of companies don't shield their apps. They're very easily hacked. So there's uh, the best in class uh, apps that I see out there. You really look and try to do things using bank level security. And it can be expensive, but there's cheap things your companies can do to address most of the major concerns. And, 
From a hacking perspective, people always ask me, well, is, can you be foolproof? No. If a government wants to hack you, they will. Uh, they'll be able to do it. It's all about bandwidth and power. Um, but I tell companies, all you have to do is don't be an easy target, right? Because if you're a hacker, you're going to look at everything. You're going to have tools to probe. You're going to find a weaker target. So you don't want to be the weaker target. <laughs> And that's really all the best any security or any company can do. Just don't be the easy target. So look at best practices. There's a lot around best practices. Also, another big concern uh, in the heat of internet age and now in the heat of the crypto age, uh, there's a lot of new companies that are racing so fast to try to get to the holy grail of being the first and fastest at what they're doing that they don't really do a lot of due diligence around staff and contractors. So that's one thing you, know, you want to look at, who your staff. Do you, have you done credit checks? Have you done security checks? Um, and that ties into with the governance layer as well, which I'll get to in a minute. So do, who has interest? Who has access to things? And a lot of small startups, you know, a 10-person startup, are they going to have a really sophisticated governance and, and, and coding policy? That's something to look for when you're investing in a company. Um, also, the HSM, the hardware layer, do they understand that uh, and making sure they understand how to manage keys in a good way. Security, software providers, people like uh, HashiCorp, I like their Vault product, but there's lots of other companies do that. In the best practices, what they do is they only open their Vault for a limited amount of time, let's say 20 minutes a day, and all software new versions have to go up and down in that 20 minute window. Otherwise, nobody has access to it. So from a development perspective, you might say, wow, that, that's pretty tough uh, to meet that window. But then they can track pretty clearly who moved software in and out, who it was and at what time. And that's a, that's a good version control um, security. So depending upon how sophisticated the companies are that you're investing in, one of the things, do they have a governance policy? You know, who has access to things? These are the kind of things you want to look at. Network, network security, Cisco, you know, there's a lot of best practices around that. And that's something that companies can do good, but do they have a policy? What network are they using? Are they using VPNs? How are they moving their code around? Something to look into. And distributed organizations. So you see a lot of companies out there that have you know, five developers here, three developers in Singapore, two in the Ukraine doing various pieces. Um, for security perspective, that can be very, very dangerous um, as you have code moving around. And unless they're using really private VPNs, you never know who's sniffing at the Wi-Fi. And depending upon what kind of security or how much money is going to be transacted on your software, that's something to consider. So what I've, what I've seen happen is some of these distributed companies said, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to bring everybody to one place, one office, um, to, for security reasons as well as communication reasons. So it's a bit of both. I, I'm seeing some very big companies that have raised a lot of money do that and moving away from a distributed um, development model. Also, there's a lot of things you can look at around the company's best practices on the programming side. Uh, so you might have a contractor that's very well known, but are they sub are they subbing out to some of your development to other contractors? Where are those? Do you have a chain of providence on who's using or who's developing your code, where all the developers are? And are those developers outsourcing to other people? And that's something that a lot of people don't think of until there's a problem, and then they find out that, okay, maybe they outsourced it to a big company which was respectable, who then outsourced it to a smaller company who might not be so respectable because you negotiated a very hard price. So they went to some place that was cheaper and maybe less secure. So as an investor, that's, that's something I look at and I'm, I think you should, uh, you'd want to know, and at least the CTO and the CEO should understand and have asked those questions about their suppliers, both in-house and out, outside. So uh, counting uh, counts is something that software counts, you know, GitHub, all the different software tools out there. Who has access to these things? And does the company have a policy? Also on the transaction side, uh, if they're moving things in and out of wallets, do they have a hot wallet policy, a warm wallet, and a cold storage policy? How are they managing all that? Do they, is it just kind of ad hoc, or do they have a very clear policy? And even if it's not their policy isn't that good, if they're thinking about it and they've got it written down, they're probably ahead of the game, and there's best practices they can see up and down there. 
So uh, one thing, uh, this is an ongoing discussion, open source. Do you do an open source project for some of your tools and some of your components, or do you do proprietary? Do you do it all in-house? I don't think there's one correct answer. <laughs> and as an investor, and as somebody who's running a tech company, I, I don't think there is one correct answer to this. I like to look at the debate, and I'm just gonna talk about a few components on both sides of the debate. And then one thing you can do is you can just uh, have that conversation with the companies you're investing, or if it's your own company, think about it. And there's no right solution to this. So the first thing is, you know, crypto and blockchain is all about anonymity. And I think that's important, and that's a huge reason why a lot of people have gotten into crypto in the first place. But from a long term and from a development perspective, there are pluses and minuses, and there are checks and balances, and there are risks involved with going open source or proprietary. So yes, the developers, people might be, you know, you don't know who they are, but then can you trust them? Does the power sit with three or four people, or three or four hundred people, or three or four thousand people? So there's voting. Uh, one good example of this is uh, I know the founder of one of the largest exchanges in the world, and he is developing a number of different cryptocurrencies, and he's the backer of some very well-known cryptocurrencies. And you know what? He loses sleep overnight. He loses sleep at night over um, somebody taking over from a voting perspective and gaining control from a voting perspective, people he doesn't know and doesn't trust that might be accumulating things on the side. So that's, that's something he's concerned and he's trying to find ways of mitigating that. Um, so from a voting perspective, who's really in control? Is it known? Are you basing your company on something that, could, uh, that you could lose control over? So are there bad actors? Uh, yes, if things are anonymous, you might, know who, you might not know who they are. If you're working with IBM and Ledger, you know, the trade-off is okay. You kind of know that they're a legitimate actor, but then they might be very slow to make changes. Um, and there might be a lot of politics, you know, from government level on down involved. And then who has access? So IBM in some ways might be more secure, but if the FBI says, you know, we want access, are they going to say, you know, open the kimono and, and give it all away. So those are the kind of things you really want to look at your business model, your company, and, and think, are they making the right choices? Have they had that conversation? Or are they just going with the tide of where everybody else is going and could have a problem, uh, you know, down the road? So bad actors, standards. So the standards, uh, in my mind, I call this the three Fs. Uh, fighting, uh, forking, and the Friendster phenomenon. So fighting, okay, you've chosen your, your, uh, your tokens of choice, your, your platforms of choice, but what happens if there's a bug or there's a problem and the voting and the people coming together can't make a decision? Is that gonna impact your business? Is it private? Are you public? How do the tokens work? So that's something nobody thinks, oh, we're, we're not worried about that, it'll never happen, but when it does happen, is your business gonna go bust? Is it gonna implement? Is it gonna slow you down and let your competitors get ahead? So it's something to think about. Think about all the problems. And then forking, if there's a problem, are you gonna fork it off or do you have the resources to do that successfully? Can you manage something like that? Is your company big enough? Do you have the expertise? That's a problem, something to think about. And the last one is I, I call the, uh, the Friendster uh, phenomenon. So before I do that, Friendster is pretty old. Can we just have a show of hands? Who has heard of Friendster? Okay, this is a, a pretty sophisticated uh, tech community, probably more than half. So the Friendster phenomenon is very interesting. So Friendster was head of Facebook and had the opportunity to acquire Facebook. They chose not to because they thought they were gonna beat them. And the VCs who put a lot of money into Friendster said, don't bother, don't buy them. For, I think it was a price was something around 10 million. Don't buy them. We're going to beat them, and we're going to give you all this money. You're going to be on the cover of Time Magazine and Wired, and we're going to blow them away, and here's all the money, and you go hire out the best CTO out there, an ex-guy from AT&T or a very big tech company is your CTO now, and we're going to beat them. So that CTO went out and bought the fastest servers from that AT&T had ready to go. Poor Facebook didn't have the money. They were really poor. So what did they do? They said, well, they went to Sun, because they knew Sun, and Sun was getting to ready to launch some new servers. Nobody would buy them. Nobody would touch them. And 
but they said, listen, Facebook, we need, you need some servers? We'll cut you a really good deal. And those servers were a lot faster than the AT&T CEO had because the servers from Sun were the next generation. Because they, uh, Facebook couldn't afford the old school, they chose the wrong technology. And then when Facebook and Friendster went head to head, Friendster took about 30 seconds to load, Facebook would load in five minutes. In a year, Facebook owned the market. Friendster is a footnote. And the founder of that is a very bitter guy <laughs> um, who I, I've uh, met before at a panel. So you can choose, you know, you can have a fight, your product can fork, but also if you choose the wrong technology, if it's not fit for purpose, and you choose the old one, you can fail. Or if you choose something that's too new and all the bugs haven't been fixed and you're building your company on quicksand, you can also fail. So that's something that it's hard to see, but it's something that a good CEO and a good team will think about, talk about, and, and discuss openly with their board and investors. And it's something to look for. Is it old? Is it new? How proven is it? So then let's look at uh, testing bugs from an open source perspective. Uh, I just read a couple of days ago that uh, a very well-known early crypto investor bought Jax, the, the wallet, that had a flaw and lost, I think, around $40 million last summer from it. And people were pointing the fingers. He probably got a good deal on acquiring this wallet. And he said, oh, it was a bug, but you know, it's been fixed. So is it proprietary? or is it open source? So uh, the balance is, okay, let's say it's proprietary. You can do the testing yourself. You can really get down to the code level and you know all the people that wrote the code so you can fix the bugs. But his opinion was, well, it's open source. So we have thousands of people finding bugs and it's much more secure that way. So the balance is, okay, you might have a lot of people finding it's open source. Everybody can see your code. That's really good. You might find things, but what happens if something gets fought and the guy says, wow, I can put, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to steal something or when the time comes, I'll steal. I'm not going to report that. And so that's kind of the dilemma of if it's open source or proprietary. If it's proprietary, in some ways it's more secure, but you're going to have a lot less eyes looking at that. And if you do have eyes looking at it and they're the best in the field that you can afford, it's going to be a lot more expensive. Um, a good example is some of the big global banks that we work with spend upwards of $2 million just securing their five to 10 mobile apps. Let me repeat that. One to $2 million a year just securing their mobile apps because they can't afford, uh, they can't afford to get hacked and that's proprietary. So um, that's the debate on the uh, testing and bug side. So internal, external. The last thing is the vendor, and I, I, I alluded to this a little early, the vendor side. Are you, do you have your vendors? Who are the vendor's vendors? How are they doing things? So you might have a secure vendor, but how far down and how important is that to the success of your operations? And if one of your vendors failed or got hacked, would that take you down with them as well? <coughs> so some of the hacks and scams, uh, the first three are uh, some high level, you've probably heard about them. So there's one thing called uh, crypto jacking. Uh, that happened to Tesla and Aviva. Aviva is a big uh, UK insurance company. The Tesla one was, I think, reported relatively recently. It's more of a server hack. Somebody had hacked into the Tesla servers and were using some Tesla servers to mine crypto. Um, and you've probably heard about, uh, heard about that. Some of the other scams, as you know, on Telegram, there's a lot of fake, fake bounties. There were fake ICOs, um, you know, that have been getting a lot of media attention in the U.S. Uh, another one that was related to crypto was ATM. For $25,000, you could go online and get some software that would mimic. You could, if you get it into the ATM, it would siphon off uh, some of the ATA money and, and, and send it back in Bitcoin to the hacker. So uh, I think Trend Micro, the big Japanese security firm, caught that in, uh, you know, online that you could go buy that software for $25,000. That's how Bitcoin gets a bad reputation sometimes by governments. Uh, some more recent ones, and I, I try to update this in July, the, the Bancor, which is an Israeli company, 
They got hacked. They're an exchange. They got hacked for 23 million. They shut it down, though, and were able to uh, get, uh, I think they may only lost thir around 13 and a half million. And from an investor perspective, you know, Tim Draper, a very, very well-known investor, uh, you know, and, and here's a company, Bancor, that raised 150 million. You can't say they were not well financed. And they had some, you know, some of the world's most famous venture capital investors, and, and they still got hacked. Uh, the interesting thing with them is a after they got hacked, uh, they called up a lot of their partners and started tracing the money. We were able to recover, you know, at least half of it. And uh, here's an exchange, you know, crypto security, all about decentralization. And you know what they said to the public? They said, there should be more cooperation about tracking things. <laughs> um, so which is the exact opposite of what a lot of the inventors of crypto and decentralization wanted. But they really acknowledge that the best way to get hackers is to work together, um, maybe with governments as well. So there was the corn rail, the $40 million uh, Korean hack uh, a, a little while ago. They think that was an inside job. Um, the nice hash last year, that, that's notable because $80 million, it's, it's pretty big. And they said it was an employee credential hack. Um, and previously, there's the, the coin check, the very famous uh, Mt. Gox one. Interesting thing was there is they're one of the early, uh, you know, er early exchanges. They had no version control on their software, and uh, they had no formal testing procedure before they uploaded code to the public. Like, uh, that is completely unheard of today, and that's why they lost a lot of money. Uh, DOA attack. Uh, you know, if the attack is bad enough, uh, it can even cause you to fork your, uh, your currency, uh, your, your blockchain. So th that's pretty bad. <laughs> um, but those things happen. So I think one of the learning on the scams and hack side is that as a company and as an investor, you want to make sure there's no single point of failure, whether it's a person in the company, whether it's a technology, that there's redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. And this is something that the banks who have been using public key infrastructure to manage your keys for your credit cards and your electronic wallets that have been out there since the late 90s. This is something they do very, very, very well. They have very good technology, but they couple on, that, on a very traditional and very robust personal management system. They check you. They have procedures in place for all this. They have backups. They have redundancy. If this person gets hit by a bus, if, if the servers go down, they do a lot of that. And you know, as a startup and in a new industry, you want to take the learnings from the old industry, the bank, and then improve it, and then you know, drive them into the ground, uh, which is what I, I think will happen. But there's a, still a lot to be learned, and it's a balance as an investor, how much of this, because it slows down development, versus moving fast and beating the competition. Because the best thing that can happen is the competition moves so fast, they don't see the cliff and they go over it. So that's something you definitely want to consider as an investor. So the aside, I think I'm going to skip this. Uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'll just get to the conclusions. So what I think is happening, what I see happening in the security world and the crypto, and what I see really happening is there's a lot of better tools coming online. And uh, you know, technology is one big way to solve this problem, but technology coupled with good best practices and good people management. Because most of those hacks and scams, they're all, they get by because people make mistakes, people don't do things with their key, they don't have the procedures in place. So that's the key thing that we are the weakest link. It's, it's not always the technology. But there's tools coming on place. You're seeing that Japan has recently announced that they're acquiring a lot of security tools to track a lot of transactions. If you look at uh, you know, uh, chain analysis is one, they work with the FBI to track fraudulent transactions and wallets. And that's something that uh, some of the exchanges that have got hacked said, yes, we need better cooperation. We need better tools. Um, if you're looking at things like, uh, well, anyways, from a security perspective, there's a few companies out there that, are, that have tools that governments are starting to use uh, to catch fraud and to catch uh, hacks. So I, I think, uh, Industry coordination is, is important. People need to talk to each other, even competitors. So I, I see what's happening as a holistic approach. They'll be taking the learnings from the banking industry and applying them to the, to the crypto industry. So one thing is very important from an investor is the management teams, experience of the management team, 
is there somebody there that has lived through a, six, uh, a life cycle where things have gone down? You know, it, it's one thing to have to think about, well, what happens when the network goes down or when your wallet gets hacked? It's a second thing to have somebody on the team who's lived through that a few times and, and can understand the strains and stresses. So you, you see companies like, uh, you know, that take different approaches to things. Uh, Revolut is a challenger bank from the UK that raised 150 million earlier this year and have a one and a half-ish million customers. They outsource a lot of their development to, uh, to uh, Eastern Europe, and they're in the process of getting a banking license from, I believe, Lithuania, which is not kind of your mainstream for a UK company. Uh, banks, the company I'm involved with, we do everything in the UK. Our software development is in the UK. All our banking, we're FCA regulated. Everything is UK. Slower, it's a lot more expensive, but we think that's a, a good learning experience. We have a lot of ex-bankers that want to destroy the banks. Um, you get people like uh, R2, C2, which is a small kind of specialist exchange. They're ex-Goldman Sachs guys. They're very, very, very conservative. Uh, I think I failed their KYC, even though I knew them, um, you know, to open an account there. So you get people like Hivex, uh, which is another OTC. They're backed by a very, very big and well-known Australian company. So, you know, from an investor perspective, yeah, they're small, they're 15 people, but they use, they're backed by a big company and they use you know, encryption on things like WhatsApp, you can buy and sell on WhatsApp. So it's interesting, I see all these different companies all taking slightly different approaches to security. And uh, you know, as an investor, that's something you should weigh up and, and, and definitely consider. So from, uh, I guess, another key learning is, when you're looking at a company, don't just look at what they're doing, look on the tech whole technology stack. Is there people in the organization who understand the different levels that they need to know? Okay, what happens if a, you know, if a level, if something happens in the security at different levels, there's somebody who can understand it and address that, or you're going to have to go to a vendor. So take a holistic approach. Um, there's some good companies on the mobile application side. Uh, Mfirst, there's a free scanning tool out there if you want to check your mobile app and see how secure it is relative to the banks uh, and stuff. There's uh, free tools out there. There's companies like Arxon that, you know, and IBM that protect. Uh, they have some very, very sophisticated tools. You know, and a lot of this AI and, and machine learning things for transactions, it's been around for decades. So back in the 90s, I saw IBM has this and all the credit card, MasterCard and Visa, they look at all the transactions and they're very good at detecting fraud from this. So you'll see all that stuff migrating into the crypto and blockchain world. The other thing you'll see is all the different layers people will be addressing. They'll be start be, you know, I think blockchain is inherently secure. Um, but it's very important that you look at the team. It's all about the team, the team, the team. Are there people experienced there? Are there people that have lived through this? What could possibly go wrong? Um, and and that, that's very important. And as an investor, it gives you a, a, level, of, uh, a level of comfort. So uh, I think the last thing is uh, kind of high level. Uh, and early, it's software is, is important. And then you're seeing hardware solutions combining hardware and software. And I know people at Gemalto and IBM are looking at embedding security within the chips and within some of the hardware, so it'll be a combination of hardware and software solutions to try to take some of the human error out of things. So I think that's kind of the way I see things developing. And there's a lot of interesting things happening in the security space. Um, and that's it. That is my presentation. So uh, thank you. If there are uh, any questions, I, I think we have about 10 minutes for some Q&A. And the problem is I've got lights in my eyes. So, ah, somebody here, yes. Yeah. Can you elaborate, in the, I, I'm lost with the connection between the smart card or the, the SIM and the blockchain technology. I don't see any, any connection with the, those two technology. You're talking about the crypto side or, or what? Because the distributed ledger, mm -hmm. there's not, nothing like that in a, in a SIM or a, a smartphone. Ah, the key management uses all the same PKI and hardware infrastructure. So if you look at all the crypto, they're, they're all using the same key generation infrastructure that's been around since the late 1990s. That's the same key infrastructure that's used for EMV and smart cards. 
Yes. Anybody else? Uh, is, there, is there a question here? We have 10 minutes. There has to be a nod. Is there anybody? Uh, uh, right here. Right here. Oh. This is a silly question, but uh, a lot of people know that cryptocurrency was built in probably 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto. Why not everybody is conscious about that this thing since 1999? So, that's like saying the SUV, well, I, let's say the first SUV was, let's say, in 2000, or let's say, 99. Let's like saying, oh, the SUV was invented in 2000. Well, SUV is really taking a pickup truck and putting a car front end or interior on a pickup truck and charging 30% more, 25% more. So you could say, yes, the SUV was invented um, in 1999. Or you could say, well, no, the, the SUV was invented in 1920s when, you know, Volkswagen and the Americans, Ford, and, you know. So the components, so if you look at crypto, 80% or blockchain, 80% of their technology existed. What crypto and, and Sashito, uh, excuse me, uh, came up with is the blockchain part of it. So taking all the layers that existed and have existed and the banks have been using for long and just adding that compete piece so we've been doing, you know, crypto is just a piece of code that sits on a card or sits on a distributed, you know, and that was the blockchain, that was the innovation. So taking what had gone before, adding that innovation, and suddenly, instead of calling it an air mile loyalty point, calling it a Bitcoin, and adding that blockchain layer. But all the hardware, 80 to 90% of what was underneath it has been around for a long time. It's a great innovation. Has the FTC gone after any of the crypto companies for having such poor security measures? Well, um, yes. So if you go online, there's a couple of government websites that list all the people in, that have been prosecuted for that. And you can just do a search. And you can see, and you can see the, fines, the fines that they've been paid, at least in the, the UK, and they cover a lot of the uh, GDPR stuff for all of Europe. So they, they have been. I mean, they're saying that you can lose 4% of your global revenue. So just last week, uh, BT got hacked for about a week. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But most likely, they'll just look. If you have the governance and you have the policies in place, and you're trying to follow them, most likely the regulators will just kind of slap your hand. And, you know, I haven't seen anybody really lose. I don't think anybody's going to lose 4% of their revenue unless they're doing something very fraudulent they're, you know, ignoring. So if you're trying, that's, that's the first step from a, from a fine perspective. Your company might go bust and, and you might get fired <laughs> if you get hacked and the board decides, your investors decide you haven't done a good job on that. Yes. Would you please comment about uh, the, uh, a biometric uh, login uh, as uh, it would defeat hacking? It would defeat? Hacking. Hacking. Yes, so uh, biometrics has been around, uh, I remember in the 90s with Gem Alto, we did a, a lot in biometrics with fingerprints putting them into laptops and storing it on a card that you could carry and then put in. And it's good, but uh, so uh, bi it has really evolved. So I think biometrics is now starting to come to the forefront. So I think in the late 80s and early 90s, it was this kind of start of that and it's getting better and better and better. And I think probably in the next few years and now I'm starting to see some technologies that exist that are not just the face or the, the thumbprint, but adding extra layers of biometric protection, like uh, allowing you to see if it's, you know, has, have you hacked off somebody's thumb? Can you see the blood flowing? There's such levels of security that, you know, eventually it'll be DNA. And so I see things like that coming along and will probably be dominating the market uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few, so combinations of, of biometric stuff. Uh, and also, you know, they say with quantum computing, but that, that's probably a ways away. So I think biometrics over the next few years is really going to come to the forefront because it's very, very, very difficult 
to uh, to hack. The um, yes. You were talking about oh. hacks on different exchanges, and a lot of that it goes back to those exchanges not having full competencies in this area. Yes. Mount Gox being one of the yeah. perfect examples. Yes. I mean, what was it? Trading cards before, right? So yeah. Something like that. Um, Blockchain inherently, if you're looking at exchanges now, they make a lot of compromises because of the limit on the transaction systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, P2P exchanges are supposed to be more secure inherently if they're not, it, like if you're not going through a hot wallet constantly and it's mm -hmm. actually directly a wallet to wallet transaction that's decentralized. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the insecurities lie in that kind of system? Trust. So if you look at uh, a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, a lot of the OTC desks, 99.9% um, .9 of the transactions are fraudulent on OTC. So if you ask anybody here who's working in OTC or has an OTC desk, uh, most of the people that are approaching them to do these trades are not real. So a peer-to-peer -peer network, some of them a technology perspective it might be, but if you don't trust the person putting in the money, would you trust a peer-to-peer -peer network that was built you know, in a dodgy jurisdiction like maybe the Cayman Islands? Would you put your money there and then if it gets lost, you know, we've heard about even people in the US on OTC and peer-to-peer -peer transactions, you know, something goes wrong and then the company who does it says, oh, the FBI said we can't move the money. So uh, from a fraud perspective, uh, you know, we've seen things like that happen. So the, pro the problem with the crypto exchanges is everything is hot because there's things moving around so fast, there's huge amounts of money. And if you're going to hack, you're going to hack a bank where you know most of the money is sitting in a vault, triple air gapped, nuclear protected, or something where there's a lot of money transacting and it's easier. That assumes one wallet at a decentralized exchange format. This is like Coinbase acquired the other one. It'd be like a wallet to wallet transaction. A lot of those don't go through a centralized wallet. Yes. Uh, That's the what I'm saying. What is the I think most of the security that the hacks that I've seen from the exchanges. So this year, as of August, the headline is over $700 million have been lost from exchanges. So yes, there's better ways of doing it, but they still lost $700 million of people's money in the, in the last you know, nine months. So there's definitely security flaws. A lot of them are personal issues and you know, are human, human error. The technology can be perfect, but if the people running it you know, leave their credentials somewhere, you, you can get hacked. So I think the, the weakness is the people. Um, and the fact that a lot of these exchanges, the people running them have not run billion dollars a day worth of transactions. Where people like Goldman Sachs and HSBC and the New York Stock Exchange have, but they're, they're kind of watching. They're not, they're doing blockchain, they're using blockchain for back office stuff, but not consumer led stuff. So it, it's a learning curve. So a lot of these exchanges are, you know, Mt. Cox is a perfect example. They're one of the first ones. The, the, it's a big learning curve. So from an investor perspective, where on the learning curve is your team and the technology that you're investing in? I have a question um, over here. It's okay. <laughs> uh, you mentioned one of the holes uh, in security is uh, are the mobile apps. Yes. Can you comment a little bit about the best way to fix that? Yes, yeah, so there's a short-term solution and there's a long-term solution. So. There's some tools available by companies like MFIRST where you can upload your APK, thank you, scan, the, scan your, your mobile app and it'll find some of the weaknesses. And then there's companies like Arxon, MFIRST, IBM that you can go to to help you fix that. So short term, that's a really good fix. If your product is out in the market, you know, it's a low cost, a few thousand to maybe 15,000, 20,000 if you're a bank to really secure that and you know, they haven't, They've got a very good track record on the hacking front. Nobody has gotten through that. Longer term, put better procedures in place and work with companies like MFIRST or Arxon or some of the like AppDome out there to really penetration testing of your, your, your security um, and, and how, you, how you encrypt things. 
So short term test with the f some of the free tools out there, shield, uh, encrypt, and then long term have good procedures in place. I think that's uh, all the time I have. Thank you very much. And I'll be available in the back if you'd like to ask a further follow on question or uh, ch chat about anything. Okay, thank you.